I want to talk through one example of a religious expression that would fit a lot of what we just talked about, that would fit under this umbrella that um, I described in the previous lecture. And that's the religion of Haitian voodoo. Now, you may know that there are, you know, that, that voodoo came from Africa. And so there is an African voodoo. But um, voodoo is an indigenous religion. And so it takes on the qualities of a certain area. And so as voodoo came to Haiti, and we'll talk about how that happened here in a few minutes, it took on its own unique uh, features in Haiti that it didn't have in Africa. And actually, even within Haiti, there are things that are different as far as what you find with voodoo. I mean, for people who live in the mountains and nowhere close to the coast in Haiti, there are things that are concerns of theirs, things that they need help from the spiritual realm for, that may not be concerns of people on the coast. And the same is true of people on the coast, that voodoo practitioners that live on the coast of Haiti probably have interest about catching fish and safety from hurricanes and all that, that the people in the mountains don't have. And so there are different rituals, uh, different expressions that you will find that even within a particular area, you find uniqueness as far as these indigenous religions. And Haitian voodoo would be an example of how that plays out. But I'm going to talk about some of the broad strokes of Haitian voodoo and use those to illustrate some of the things that we just talked about. Um, Haitian voodoo, is, as hopefully you would discern, is what you find um, in the country of Haiti. Now, Haiti occupies part of an island. It's an island that is about 700 miles off the coast of Florida from Miami um, in the Caribbean. And on the west side of this island, you have Haiti. And on the east side, you have a country called the Dominican Republic. And the entire island is called Hispaniola. Um, Haiti, you know, we talked about that within these religions, that isolation of various sorts keeps practices, keeps kind of the body of spirituality unique, as long as there's some sort of isolation. And you can find some of those types of isolation with Haiti, I mean, even though it's just 700 miles off the coast of Florida. Uh, for, one, for one type of isolation, Haiti, as I said, shares an island with the Dominican Republic. Well, they speak different languages. They actually, even as far as political stability, are very different from one another. And so there's, there's very little communication back and forth. I think that the Haitians are interested in receiving some communication from the Dominican, but the Dominican's not really that interested in communication with Haiti. And so there's, there's kind of an isolation built in there just politically and as far as language. The Dominican Republic primarily speaks Spanish. Most of the people in Haiti speak a language called Creole, which is kind of a mixed language of French, Spanish, um, Swahili. It was kind of a slave trade language back in earlier times. So, th so you have a, a geographical language isolation in that way. You have the communications isolation in Haiti. Uh, there was, for several years when I went to Haiti, I stayed down on the southern peninsula in this little village. It was a village of about 6,000 people. And in this little village uh, of Grand Guave, there were three telephones. And rarely, if ever, did all three even work. And they were all in this, this place called the Teleco. Now, there's always someone there running the Teleco, uh, whether any phones were working or not. But there were only three phones. But you know, if you would go down to the Teleco, pretty much the only people using the phones were visitors we Americans. And it, it was set up kind of interestingly because you had the three phone booths and then the rest of the room were probably four or five rows of, I don't know, maybe six chairs in each row. And I suppose in, that's kind of there as a, as a waiting area to wait to make your calls, but what it usually appeared to me was the case, at least when we were there, was that you had the Americans trying to use the phones and you had the Haitians sitting in the chairs watching the Americans trying to use the phones. And it was kind of the entertainment of, of, of the downtown. But you know, that for the Haitians, why would they use the phones? I mean, most of them lived in this small village. Most of their relatives lived in this small village. 
Maybe they had some relatives that were living in Port-au-Prince, the capital city, to try to make some money to send home <coughs> that they might occasionally hear from. But by and large, anybody that they would want to communicate with was right there. So there was, you know, communications outside this village were, were minimal, if at all. There's, um, there were sort of a geographical transportation sort of isolation that's built in. Uh, when, you, when you fly into Haiti, you fly into the international airport that's in Port-au-Prince. And if you'll look at this map, uh, you'll see it marked there uh, where the capital city is, Port-au-Prince. And um, from that city up to the north coast, and you'll see a town up there on the north coast called port au -Pay. Uh That's the, over the last 10 years or so when I've gone to Haiti, that's where I've gone is port au -Pay. Well, from Port-au-Prince to port au -Pay is about 125 miles. The first few years I went down there, actually for several years, we always took a, a vehicle on the roads up to port au -Pay. When we would take that 125 mile trip, if we had a good day of travel, no flat tires, didn't get stuck in any of the rivers, didn't have to stop and pull another bus out that got stuck in the river so we could get through, <laughs> if everything went smoothly, we could make that 125 mile trip in six to seven hours. And that's the only road going from south to north in Haiti, was that road. And that was people who could afford that type of transportation to make that trip. Again, by and large, people don't travel within Haiti that much because they pretty much stay in their own areas unless they go into the capital city to get a job to try to make more money. But you know, transportation isn't hasn't been as important as for the people that live in Haiti as for those who come in from the outside to travel around. Now you can fly up there and land on a uh, kind of a pothole gravel runway and you can fly up there in about 45 minutes. And so even though it feels a little scary to make that flight, it's much more uh, advisable than that six, eight, uh, I think one time it took us 14 hours to make that 125 mile trip. So there's, there's just some built-in aspects of isolation that allow pockets of people in Haiti to be people who practice voodoo, but it will look different in those areas because there's not a lot of connection between these areas. Um, so Haiti, as I said earlier, is in the Caribbean. If you look at um, this slide here that shows the mountains going right up to the coast. And that's, Haiti is all mountains. When you fly in over Haiti, it's mountains and coast. And, uh, and again, they go right up to the coast. So, it's, so travel's not easy in Haiti. There's not very many flat places in Haiti where uh, you can build roads that will last. So these next few slides uh, show you some of the mountainous nature of Haiti. Now, this slide with these huts on it. I want you to remember this, because this is going to play into kind of the spiritual worldview or voodoo worldview there in Haiti. Um, most Haitians live, especially rural Haitians, live in huts like these. Dirt floors, mud walls, grass roof. One, maybe two small rooms. You might find when you get into some of the villages, you might find these types of homes, or you might find some that have uh, brick walls and grass roof. Often they still have dirt floors. And even those that have the, the brick walls or concrete block walls, they've probably made the blocks themselves. Some are constructed out of scrap metal that they've picked up at a dump somewhere. But those are the types of homes most Haitians live in. I mean, Haiti's, uh, the, the average income in Haiti is less than $300 a year. So, that, so if you've, you've got a decent middle class job in Haiti, you have to make a dollar a day. Now things in Haiti, by and large, cost more than they cost here. I mean, a, a car in Haiti costs way more than it costs here. Meat in Haiti costs way more than it costs here. So they make obviously a lot less money, a dollar a day, and the cost of things is a lot more. Thus you have Haiti as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So you've got the poverty, and, so, and remember these homes. Then uh, you see this shot of, of a river in Haiti. Well, this is, the rivers in Haiti are always at least this busy. 
When you go down the river, you'll see crowds there. And in that crowd, you'll see people bathing. You'll see people uh, doing laundry. You might see people washing their dishes. You'll see people that have their cows standing in the water and they're washing them off. You'll see a pig rolling around in the muddy edge of the water. And you'll see people down there with buckets getting their drinking water. You'll see people going to the bathroom in the water. All that. And so in Haiti, disease is a problem. 50% of the kids in Haiti die before they're six years old. Now, if you ask most Haitians what that, about that statistic, they probably couldn't quote you that statistic. But I learned right away they know the reality of that statistic. I think it was one of the first times I went to Haiti. I was helping with a uh, clothing distribution. And so, and you know, I didn't know any Creole at that time, and I still don't know a whole lot. But um, we had to ask them their names. And a lot of the little girls throughout the morning, when I would ask them their name, they would say T. Fee. And a lot of the little boys, when I asked them their name, they'd say T. Garçon. So I think it was at lunch that day, I said, how come so many of them have, so many little girls are named T. Fee and so many are named T. Garçon? Well, some of you that are sharper than I am, and maybe know some French, uh, know that T. Fee, or you might deduce that T. Fee means little girl, and T. Garçon means little boy. And what I learned was that Haitians know that there's as good a chance that a child's going to die as live. And so a lot of times they don't even name their kids. They just call them little girl and little boy. And then when they, over time, as they get older, they may start calling them a name, or there may be some nickname they were calling them that they just kind of stick as their name, or they may try to enroll them in a school, and so they need a name, and so they give them a name. I have a friend that runs a school in Haiti, and there are amazing stories about birth certificates in Haiti because of that dynamic, that they don't name their children because they know because of disease so many of them will die. And a lot of it is you can trace back to just the water and the lack of sanitary conditions. The next few slides uh, show kids in a school in Haiti. Uh, there are schools in Haiti for the kids, uh, but the illiteracy rate in Haiti is 75%. Most Haitians can't read or write. So there are educational possibilities, but either they can't afford it, transportation makes it impossible, communication makes it impossible. Uh, there's a lot of things that stand in the way of getting an education in Haiti, and so many are in, uneducated. So that's kind of the, I guess, the social dynamic of Haiti. Now let's talk about the religious dynamic and then how that intersects with that social dynamic. This next uh, slide shows a mural that's in another town on that southern peninsula of Haiti. Um, a town, I believe it's uh, Laagon, where this is. And, and what this mural shows is kind of the, the history of Haiti. And, and basically what you have is that uh, Haiti originally was inhabited by what we would call Native American Indians. It was, it was Indians. I mean, when Columbus discovered America, it was likely it was Haiti that he discovered. And so there were these Native Americans there. Well, when they discovered Haiti, Haiti was 95% vegetation. It's a beautiful vegetative island. It's now 5% vegetation because of how the land's been plundered. But it was 95% vegetation. And so quickly, Spain and then France got word of this island. Uh, France and Spain began to colonize this island. And so that's why you have the Dominican Republic, Spanish-speaking, on one part of the island, and you have <clears throat> um, Haiti on the other part of the island, which the official language of Haiti is French, because you had the French and the Spanish that kind of fought over the island and stuff, but it kind of filtered out that way. So you got the uh, Spanish-speaking part of the island on the east side, French-speaking on the west side, Haiti. And so they colonized the island, and they wanted to work this land. I mean, as, as a matter of fact, there was a time when Haiti was France's richest colony because of all the agricultural products they could produce there and ship back to France. Well, so who, who would work this land for the French? Was it going to be the landowners? No. They went and they brought slaves from Africa to work the land. So 
you have uh, the Native Americans that lived on the land, and many of them were taken as slave labor for these, uh, for these different crops. And then you have the African slaves that came that had an African spiritism that we might call African voodoo today. And then you have the French colonists. You know, slavery was also kind of um, an evangelistic method. And so a lot of slave owners would impose conversion upon their slaves. And so these slaves were also introduced to European Catholicism. So you've got this melting pot going on in Haiti of French Catholicism, African voodoo, and the Native American spiritism that was already on the island. And that's to some extent what that mural is supposed to play out is all those pieces coming together on the island of Haiti, or on the island of Hispaniola, and particularly Haiti. The next uh, slide that you see, or a couple slides, are uh, crucifixes, or Catholic monuments in, um, in some of these villages on the southern peninsula. Haiti is officially Catholic, just like officially French is their language. And, but yet, the worldview that most Haitians operate out of is this Haitian voodoo worldview. First time I went to Haiti, I was told, you're going to get to see some, uh, some voodoo temples in this village that you go to. And it's been so long ago that I don't really remember the exact image I had in my mind of a voodoo temple. But it wasn't what I saw when I saw my first voodoo temple, which was also what the second one looked like as well. But they look like this one that you see here. I'd, and that only makes sense, like the homes of the people. Dirt floors, mud walls, a grass roof. Maybe a little bigger than a home, but not a lot bigger. And what you see on the outside of this voodoo temple is charcoal drawings of different magical rituals, different things that they do to appease the spirits or to try to bring help to them from the spirit realm. Now, this temple that you see there, if we go to the next slide, this is what, one of the things you see inside that temple. Now, you can probably tell whose image that's supposed to be hanging on that door inside this voodoo temple. Looks like the Virgin Mary, right? <laughs> because one of the things that happened was that you had this more spiritist mindset of the of the. Uh, the Indians that were living on Haiti as well as the Africans that were brought to Haiti. They had a spiritist mindset. That you have all these spirits that you can appease, that can help you, that you can call on for assistance. And then they're introduced to French Catholicism. Well, they don't really quite know the language, but they see the ritual and they participate in the ritual. And what they are introduced to are saints, beings that they can pray to for assistance and for help, just like their spirits. Well, you can use all the help you can get. <laughs> So they adopted a lot of the, actually most of the Catholic saints that they were introduced to were brought into their spiritist practices as well. And so, yeah, she might be Virgin Mary at a Saturday night mass or a Sunday morning mass, but she is a voodoo spirit, a voodoo loa, when you go to the temple, the voodoo temple on Thursday night or Friday night that they've taken on uh, this, this blending of Catholicism with the spiritism of, of the Indians and of the African voodoo. You'll notice in these next two or three slides that there's crosses. And that, that's a unique feature of Haitian voodoo, that they have also taken the cross from Catholicism and it's been adopted into this Haitian voodoo spiritism. Now, for them, it's not about uh, Jesus or it's not about redemption that they see the cross. And actually, probably if you ask most Haitians what the cross uh, symbolizes within voodoo, most of them probably would say that it's just a symbol. But what people who try to give explanation of symbols would say who are Haitian, probably a lot of shamans and witch doctors, is that the cross represents uh, the intersection of the spiritual realm with the physical realm of life. That you've got this day in, day out, horizontal, physical realm that we live in with poverty, 
sick and dying kids, low education, all this, you know, drought, hurricanes, this horizontal physical realm of life. And then there's a spiritual realm of life where there might be possibility of assistance and help and maybe even blessing. And where those two intersect, the spiritual and the physical, that's voodoo. That voodoo enables the physical realm of life to get help from the spiritual realm. And so it's seen as vital to them. So you'll see crosses at sacred trees, at the homes of uh, witch doctors. One of those that was earlier was in the front yard of a man that we used to buy baskets from in Haiti, but he was also a witch doctor, and so you, you knew who the shamans were in a village if they had a cross in the front yard like that. Okay, now remember the homes. Mostly dirt, mud, grass. Maybe some cinder block, maybe some scrap metal. But think about what the homes looked like that I get showed you. Okay, then you go to the cemeteries. And look at these next several slides here. <clears throat> it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I remember the day I was standing in the gate of the wall around a cemetery in a village. And I looked out in the village, and I looked into the cemetery, and I thought, the cemetery would be a much nicer place to live than the village. <laughs> now, from what we've already talked about, you can probably speculate what is going on there. I mean, if, if you were with a group of people in Haiti and everybody was going, what's the deal? Why are the cemeteries so much nicer than the homes in the village? Probably what I've already told you, you could, you could make an educated speculation about what's going on. That you need help from the spirit realms. From the spirit realm. You need help from spirits of dead relatives. You need help from spirits of witch doctors that have died and been buried in that cemetery. So if, if you're going to need assistance from them, how do you treat them? With respect, with honor, with maybe even nicer houses than what you put your children in? Because the spirit realm is very real. And the need for help from the spirit realm is very real. Now, this is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. If, if you're operating out of that mindset that if we take good care of the spirits, they'll take good care of us. And if life is still hard, out of that mindset, what's the assumption? We're not taking good enough care of the spirits. So you put a little more paint on the spirit house. You put tile on it. You go sweep it every day. You bring offerings, grain offerings, food offerings, and leave them. You burn little fires around to offer up incense. That you've got to take care of the spirits for them to take care of you. And so there's kind of this perpetuating cycle of as things get worse, you've got to try harder to take care of the spirits. And so people will spend even life savings on these spirit houses is how they can be translated in, in one of the things that they're called. Uh, you see here in this slide some grain offerings that are left at one of the spirit houses. Uh, this slide with a white cross, um, that marks the grave, um, or at least the, the memorial for a witch doctor from that village that had died. And um, you would often, in the evening, if you'd go by the cemetery, you would often see little fires burning at the base of this cross. I mean, yeah, help from grandma's spirit might be good, but help from a witch doctor's spirit, it's better. And so people would go, or do go, and make offerings there. And so what you see here is a strong belief in magic ritual, a strong belief in spirits in all parts of life, a strong belief in appeasing those spirits and keeping them appeased, and and there is an understanding among most Haitians that there is a good God that's a high God. But that's not where most of their interaction is. Their interaction is with these spirits. A, a lot of, and again, probably because of the Catholic influence, a lot of Haitians who, are, who practice voodoo will talk about the good God, and they'll talk about Satan, Satan. But... Those are like the OTOS deities that are far away as far as the evil and the good. 
it's the it's in the spirit realm where they make a lot of their contact where they offer their magical potions and rituals and chants to try to get help in this very poor place so hopefully that's an illustration for you of how some of these beliefs about spiritist religions play out in Haiti <laughs>